22nd of July 2011, Amy Winehouse's doctor makes a routine call at her house at 6pm. Amy's health has been an issue for a long time now, so much so, doctor visits are as regular as the postman delivering mail, but not in the last month. Three weeks ago, Amy once again quit drinking in another attempt to beat her addiction. Her doctor had prescribed a Librium for withdrawals and Valium for anxiety. When the doctor arrives, she meets a tipsy Amy who smells of booze. When did you relapse? The doctor asks. Amy hasn't a clue. The days merge into one when she's on a binge. Her living bodyguard Andrew Morris informs the doctor Amy's been drinking for three days. Morris and Amy have a brother and sister type relationship. Morris described her as the sort of person that if you only met her once, you'd never forget her. The doctor asks Amy why she started drinking, to which Amy responds she was bored. When asked if she planned to stop drinking, Amy responds, I don't know. Amy doesn't seem to see the severity of her situation. She had been warned two months previous that her binges were putting her in immediate danger of death. Though Amy is reckless and self-destructive, she doesn't have a death wish. She assures the doctor she doesn't want to die. Her problem is appreciating the seriousness of her situation. Though, that also seems to be a problem with those closest to her. Some of her friends were of the opinion if she wants a drink, it's up to her. Even her current boyfriend Reg Travis told her, if you want to have a drink, just have a drink. It's not a problem, you can curb it. But Reg doesn't live with her. He lives in his own flat in Marleybone and is often busy writing and directing films. The doctor is at a loss of what to do. Alcoholism has no known cure. There are treatments, but ultimately it lies in the patient's desire to get sober and more importantly, stay sober. The doctor suggests therapy in order to deal with some of her psychological issues. Amy refuses. She never liked therapy or therapists. Of course, Amy's doctor knows this. Everybody knows this. Her unwillingness to get help is documented in her most famous song, Rehab. At this point, the doctor, knowing Amy has been drinking on top of her medication, refuses another prescription. They continue talking. Amy tells her there are still things in her life she wants to achieve, and from this, the doctor deduces she's not suicidal. Following their conversation, the doctor leaves the house. She will never see Amy again. In less than 24 hours, Amy will join the locks of Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin and Kurt Cobain in the 27 Club. Amy had always liked to drink, but not to excess. Like most alcoholics, they start off as social drinkers. It first became a problem back in 2006. At the time, her and her boyfriend Blake Fielder Civil had split. She was also releasing Back to Black. At this point, the binges began. A 5 foot 3, 110 pounds, or 7 stone 8 to my English viewers, Amy consumed enormous amounts of alcohol. I guess her problem really lay in once she started, it didn't stop. Once the lid came off, it was too difficult to put it back on. Amy drank for days and days. Amy loved North London, she always lived there, and her last home was a four story Victorian property located in Camden. After her death, like Graceland, it became a shrine to her memory. When it was put up for sale, estate agents were inundated with fans requesting to view it. It was purchased in 2012 by the one-time owner of the Mal Mason hotel chain. Much to the annoyance of the new owners, fans from all over the world came to write love messages to Amy. The front wall is used as a blackboard for any messages fans wish to give her. The new owners regularly paint the wall over and the house as of April 2024 is blurred on Google Images. When Amy purchased the house back in 2010, she ripped everything out and went about redecorating it to her taste. The floors were black in every room, the kitchen was done like an American diner, the basement was converted into a music room. Back to July 2011, with the doctor now gone, Amy was left with her bodyguard Andrew Morris and her cat Anthony. Her friends were away at a music festival and her father Mitch was performing in New York. His music career had been revived ever since Amy became famous. An hour after the doctors left, her boyfriend Reg phones 
and tells her he'll be over later with a takeaway. Amy loves takeaway. The bin is stuffed with plastic containers from the Indian food she ordered the night before. She decides not to wait for Reg and tells her to order another Indian meal. When it arrives, they both eat their meals in their bedrooms. Amy spends most of her time in her bedroom. She had the walls and ceiling knocked through and a doorway leads to an ensuite bathroom. Amy eats her food alongside her laptop that rests on her bed. Afterwards, she continues drinking and listening to music. Browsing through YouTube, she sees footage of a man she used to date and runs downstairs to her bodyguard's room to show him. At 11 p.m., her boyfriend Reg Travis finishes work and calls Amy to tell her he's on his way over. She doesn't answer her phone. Tonight, for some reason, she decides to ignore him. Travis mulls over whether or not to come over before deciding against it. It's a decision he'll regret for the rest of his life. Travis often arrives to find Amy passed out in which he leaves only to be called at one in the morning to go back over. For the next two hours, he goes back and forth on whether to visit Amy or not. He even goes so far as getting in a taxi and asking the driver to take him to Camden Square before deciding against it. At midnight, he leaves Amy a lengthy message telling her to ring him. Meanwhile, as midnight hits, Amy is watching YouTube videos with her bodyguard. At 2.30 in the morning, Andrew leaves her bedroom, heads down to his own room and watches TV for another two hours. As he falls asleep, he hears Amy moving around upstairs. He guesses she's nodded off for an hour and woke up again like she often does. At 3.30 in the morning, Amy texts her friend. The text reads, I'm going to be here always, but are you okay? Amy continues drinking before throwing up possibly on purpose, in her bathroom. After that, she collapses on her bed, kicks her shoes off, and falls asleep fully clothed. Beside her sit an open laptop and three empty bottles of vodka. 10 a.m. the next morning, her bodyguard knocks the door to check on her. He sees her lying in bed and assumes she's sleeping in as she often does. Morris doesn't see anything out of the ordinary and leaves her be. When it's almost 4pm, Morris feels something is not right. She's not up and he's not heard any noise from her bedroom. When he opens the door again, he sees her lying in the exact same position. Panic begins to set in and he checks her pulse. He can't find one. He immediately looks around to see any evidence of drug use. There's none, just the three empty bottles of vodka. Andrew quickly calls an ambulance. He tells the operator he thinks his boss has had a heart attack. When the paramedics arrive, they come in and check the pulse, but one of the ambulance crew notices rigor mortis has already set in. Shortly after 4 o'clock, Amy Winehouse is pronounced dead. With her blood alcohol level tested, it's later confirmed she died of alcohol poisoning. In other words, Amy drank herself to death. By the time her boyfriend comes to her house, it's sealed off with police tape. At the same time, ex-husband Blake Fielder Civil is incarcerated due to burglary to fund his drug addiction. When he hears of Amy's death, he collapses, breaking down in tears. Blake is inconsolable and acting erratic. The prison guards put him on suicide watch. Blake's current girlfriend and mother of his newborn child are unable to raise his spirits. She tells reporters, he's devastated and shattered. He just can't take it that she's dead and he'll never get to see her again. They were really in love and they were soulmates. In the months following, a third long awaited Amy Winehouse album is released. It contains mostly covers. Amy's estate was divided equally between her parents. With Amy's death, Mitch becomes a millionaire. Blake obviously receives nothing. Through the days, he mourns her in his prison cell. He falls asleep to dreams of Amy falling off a cliff. The dream serves as a metaphor. Like her father, her boyfriend and her friends, Blake is just another person who was unable to save her.
Thank you to everyone who supports the channel. If you wish to donate, it would be greatly appreciated as this is my main source of income. Just click the three symbols next to the video, then the thanks icon, and however much you wish to donate. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for my next video.